Okay, welcome to class. We will pick up where we left off last time. Um, maybe actually a couple of quick announcements. I didn't bring one, I'm sorry. Okay, a couple announcements. First up, um, I posted a series of these tutorials. If you own a TI-89 calculator, um, you can watch these and see how it's done. These make your life so much easier as an engineer. So if you don't know that you can use your calculator to do unit conversion as a solver for simultaneous equations, to take derivatives, to take integrals, to do those with the units included, I did a series of, of tutorial videos on YouTube that you can watch. These are all maybe three, four, five minutes long, so they're short. You can pick which one's useful. I recommend learning how to do this. I've said it before. You're spending a lot of money on your tuition. I would spend the, I bet you could find one used for like 80 bucks to have a really powerful tool. Okay, that's one thing. Another announcement has to do with the midterm. I've had some people asking, saying, you know, where did this question come from? Was this really stuff that we covered? I just want to make it really clear so there's no, no ambiguity here. Every single question came out of a homework question. And so for each one, like what the question was on the test, I stated exactly what it would be in the study guide. And then here's the exact questions that prepared you for it. So why do I bring this up? I think that for the next midterm, which is next Friday, right, the 5th, I think that's the 5th of October, um, probably the most effective study strategy is to look at the study guide, right? If on the study guide it says, you know, understand how to calculate Gibbs free energy or enthalpy, right, from, from the individual products and reactants, go back to the homework problem where you had to do that exact same thing and make sure you can do that without a TA telling you how or without looking at the solution because you know that's exactly how it's going to work on the midterm. It's going to look very very similar to a homework problem. Okay. Now uh, why are we doing the homework the, the next midterm so soon after the last one? The reason why is we've got 15 weeks in a semester but the civil engineers leave after fall break so this is their final exam. We need to do one last test for their, to be their final before fall break. That's why we're doing it on the 5th. So there was four weeks before the first exam. It'll be three weeks before this one. And then it's four weeks and four weeks for the next two, I believe. Okay? So you can take a look through here. It, I think it's just evidence that if you study the study guide and the homework associated with what's discussed in the study guide, you're going to do fine on the test. Okay? That said, let's get ready to pick up where we left off last time. Okay, our learning objectives for today are the following. First off, we're going to define polymorphism. We kind of talked about it briefly. We're going to say a little bit more about it. We're going to introduce what are called the seven crystal systems and the 14 Brave lattices. We're going to use Miller indices to be able to label planes and points and directions and families of planes and all that in these crystal structures. Um, and the last thing that we might have time to get to today is how to use X-ray diffraction, what we call XRD, to determine crystal structure. So you can take an unknown powder or metal or whatever, you can put it in an instrument and out pops a scan that will help you figure out what, what it is you're looking at. What's the phase of matter, okay? So let's start with polymorphism. Polymorphism is when you have multiple different crystal structures that a compound can form in, right? So zinc blend is a great example. Zinc sulfide. Um, It's a great example. We saw one of the, of the polytypes or the polymorphs of zinc blend. Uh, of, sorry, zinc blend is the mineral name. So the first one we saw is this one. This is one that we showed you in class. They've got some funky colors going on, but it's the cubic one that looks like diamond, except it's got two different atoms. There's an entirely different way of forming that same compound. And it goes from being cubic to hexagonal. The hexagonal one 
is called wurtzite, right? So this is an example of a polymorph. The same chemical composition, right, can exist in two different crystal structures, right? And depending on what temperature and pressure and things like that you have, it's going to tell you which one is more thermodynamically favorable, right? So for example, if one of these, maybe turn to a neighbor and discuss this. If, I, if these have different densities, right, they pack together at different amounts, and then I squeeze on the system, which one's going to be the one that forms, right? Which one's going to be thermodynamically favorable? So again, I don't know offhand which one is the more dense one, but if one is more dense, how, do we, how does that relate to the favorable phase and pressure? Anybody have a thought? Josh? Yeah, right? It's pretty straightforward. If you squeeze on it, and that might be the driving force for it to transform from one phase to the other, and I don't know which one's which in this case, right? We saw other instances of this. This is for a compound, it's zinc sulfide, but it also exists for pure elements, right? We saw this with iron, right? With the iron wire demo, it went from BCC to FCC. We don't call that polymorphism, we call that allotrophy, right? Because it's a single element. So carbon going from diamond to graphite, that's technically allotrophy, not polymorphism, but they're really the same thing, right? All right, all right let's talk about crystal structures. Um, they all have to do with symmetry, right? We've been talking about these, these lattices. We've been showing you some of them. And some of them are more symmetric than others, right? Let's take, uh, let's go all the way back to FCC, right? FCC, this is a very symmetric crystal structure, right? We could define planes all throughout this where there's, say, mirror planes or there's other symmetry operators that define this crystal structure. Other crystal structures have much less symmetry. And the way that we define crystal systems takes into account that symmetry, right? So here's our seven different crystal structures shown in the seven different rows. The each individual members, if you count them up, there's 14. Those are the 14 Brave lattices, right? So the seven crystal systems, some of them we've seen already in class, right? You've got cubic, a cubic crystal system, A, is A is A, those three different directions. The edge length is the same for all of those. And the angle between those directions is 90 degrees, right? It's a cube, right? Meanwhile, you've got a hexagonal crystal system. Hexagonal, you've got A and A down here. But this distance here is no longer equal to A. We call it C. In this case, they call it A1 is equal to A2 is not equal to A3. That's just a different nomenclature. Whether you call it ABC or A1, A2, A3, it's potatoes, potatoes, the same thing, okay? There's other ones though, right? What about this one here? This is tetragonal. Tetragonal is A and B are equal to one another, but they're not equal to that C direction, right? But they're still 90 degrees. In a hexagonal system, it wasn't 90 degrees between these, right? So then there's orthorhombic, right? Orthorhombic is right here. Now A is not equal to B, is not equal to C, but it's still 90 degrees, right? And then the other ones are a little bit harder because the angles get off. They're no longer 90 degrees, and so they start to look uh, like a little bit more complicated shapes, right? But there's only seven different ways of arranging unit cells that will fill space. There's no other way that, even if you tried to think of one, it would actually just be one of these that we're already showing you. So that's kind of interesting. That there's no other way to fill space. There's a few cheater ways that they've discovered that won a Nobel Prize recently, but they're kind of cheaters, so we're not going to talk about them. Um, <laughs> So there's the simple version of all of these. Simple means that the atoms are located only at the vertices, right, the corners. But then you've also got things like volume-centered. Another way to, to say volume-centered is body-centered, like body-centered cubic. Unsurprisingly, right, this is simple cubic, body-centered cubic, because it's got the one in the very middle. And then you can have face-centering, right, face-centered cubic. And you can even have base centering. Now, there is no base centering in the cubic crystal system, right? Um, so some of these are not allowed. Like these ones that are blank, they're not allowed by nature. What it really means is that this, if you were to put something here, it's actually one of the other ones that's already up there. It, it's, it's identical to it, OK? So those are our seven crystal systems and the 14 different Brave lattices, right? So this is the way of arranging atoms. And then once you have the symmetry, when you place atoms in here, 
Then there's a gazillion different crystal structures that you could form because you can place them in different spots and then apply the same symmetry. And we're not going to cover that in this class. It's really interesting stuff. We're not going to cover it. Okay. Um, something that we do need to talk about is, okay, you've got these different crystal systems. And as engineers, we might want to start actually tuning and changing and messing with or understanding how individual atoms might be interacting with another or acting on certain planes within there or directions. So we need a tool that everyone in the whole world can get together. And if I'm talking about this atom interacting along this direction, you guys all know what I'm talking about. So we need a standardized way of talking about points, planes, and directions. And that's called Miller indices, okay? So there's a couple rules. Let's start with just a position. Positions are the easiest. So we're gonna draw our, uh, let's say a cubic unit cell. In a cubic unit cell, if I want to give a certain point, first off, we give this thing our, our axes. So that's going to be x, y, and z. Because this is a lattice, remember a lattice is something that we could translate to fill all space. I could just keep on tiling the wall with this cubic thing. Because of that, I can choose any point to be an origin. right? I could choose that point. I could choose that point. Whatever you want. It makes most sense, and it's the default to put it in that back corner, but you don't have to. That's just what we typically do. But you can put it wherever you want, okay? If that is the origin, where I've marked it with that red dot, and I want to talk about an atom located right there, here's how you do it. You just figure out what it is in terms of the x, y, and z coordinates. It's just like you learned in like pre-algebra, Cartesian coordinates. That's all this is. You'd say, okay, in the x direction, we went forward one unit cell. In the y direction, we went forward one unit cell. And in the z direction, we went forward half of a unit cell. Therefore, that point, we're going to use round brackets. And we would say that that's located at 1, 1, half. That's where that point is located. So nothing surprising here. You've seen this before in your math classes. Uh, nothing surprising here, right? Now, what if we want to talk about a direction, though? What if this is the direction that we want to talk about? going from that point there to that point there, right? How do we define that direction? So first off, we change the notation. We don't use round brackets anymore, and we don't use commas anymore. We use square brackets, right? And the uh, one way to do it is to simply take the final position minus the initial position. So what's our initial position here? If we started up there, if we were to label that thing, that would be located at it's x is 0. We didn't move at all in the x direction. It's 1 in the y, and it's 1 in the z, right? So that's our initial position up there. We already know what our final position is. We just solved it in the other one. So if we wanted to, we could take final minus initial, and that will give us our direction, right? So we could say, you know, we could say 1, 1, half minus 0, 1, 1, and that's going to give us our direction, right? So we're going to use square brackets. And in the x, it's 1 minus 0. So it moves forward 1 in the x direction. The y is 1 minus 1, so that's 0. And the z is 1 half minus 1, so that's going to be negative 1 half. Then, by convention, directions are always given as whole numbers, not fractions. So we're going to multiply that whole thing in order to get rid of this fraction. So we just multiply it by 2. And this becomes 2, 0, negative 1. Notice how I put the bar for the 1 on top of it. They call that bar 1. It's the same as saying negative 1. If you write negative in front of it, or you put the bar on top, it's the same thing. This is more common, though, to put it on top. I don't know why. It's just how it is. Okay? So that would be that direction. By the way, it, just looking at this, if you didn't want to do this final minus initial, you could still figure out this direction. Like, when I look at that, it's clearly staying in the x plane, right? the x, z plane, it's not, it's not moving in the y direction at all. So I know that y is going to be 0, right? y is 0. And it moves forward one full unit cell x, and it goes down by half in the z. So you could just figure that out yourselves pretty easily. But if it's ever tricky, then this always works, OK? Any questions on directions and points? Pretty straightforward stuff. Now, remember, round brackets and commas for positions or points and square brackets, no commas, and make it whole numbers, not fractions for directions, okay? Okay, now there's something called families of directions, right? 
families of directions or families of planes, these are directions or planes that are crystallographically identical, meaning in the crystal, I could rotate that crystal and get the exact same plane in some way. Right? Let's give you an example. If I draw our cubic crystal system again, Okay, in this system, since it's cubic, let's say we're talking about this front face. Well, I could take that exact same crystal and I could rotate it, and it turns out that this face looks identical. The same atoms are on it. It looks identical, right? So those two planes are in the same family. In fact, all of the faces of this dice right, are in the same family. So there's a way that we can describe that. If it's families of directions versus planes, we use different terminology. For directions, we use pointed brackets, right? So this would be the family of the one, zero, zero. Um, sorry, I did, I did a plane here. So let me do directions instead. Let me get rid of all that. Let me do a direction instead. OK, let's say I'm talking about this direction and that direction. Those are in the same family. They intersect the same types of atoms, right? So we, this one, again, if we use our coordinate system, x, y, z, what is this first direction? What would be the direction of that? It doesn't move in the x direction, right? It stays in the same x plane. It moves one in the y direction, and it doesn't move at all in the z. So that direction right there would be the 0, 1, 0 direction. Meanwhile, this one over here, that would be the 0, 0, bar 1. Oh, I'm sorry. I messed that up. That would be bar 1, 0, 0 direction. OK? Because it goes back 1 in the x direction, but nothing else. These all exist in the same family of what we call 1, 0, planes. OK? I could have said they exist in the family of 0, 1, 0. It's the same thing. They're in the same family. You can pick any member of the family and put these uh, pointed brackets around it, and that means we're talking about the same family. That means that all of these, you know, every one of these things that goes along these edge, those are all members of the same family. Okay? Any questions about families of directions? Okay. In... All the crystal systems, it's pretty straightforward and easy, except for hexagonal. Hexagonal throws us off. It's tricky. So because of that, instead of having the three variable Miller indices, you have to go to one that has four indices. So instead of, let's call these, say, UVW that we've been talking about, if this is, say, U, V, and W, sometimes called HKL, uh, we have to have different ones for hexagonal. We have to have U, V, T, W, right? So it's a four indices thing. The reason they do that is because imagine you're looking down on a hexagonal unit cell. They found that it's easier to put three principal axes along that plane and the fourth one comes straight out. I don't know if that's necessarily easy or not, but that's the way that it's done. So if you see in the literature something like that, 1, 1, 2 bar, 0, you can figure out what that is in terms of three, right? We can convert that to UVW using these formulas right there, okay? So it, it's pretty straightforward transformation. I've, the one I've shown you here is going the other way. It's taking three Miller indices format and, and converting it to four, but you could solve these for U prime, V prime, and W, uh, and w prime as well, right? I'll give you just one example of this. Okay, let's do one example. Let's do, let's assume that our U, let's do a different color here. Let's assume that we're talking about the 0, 0, 1 family of planes, right? In that case, U prime equals 1. Uh, I guess we could have had that be W. Either case, V prime equals zero and W prime equals zero. So that, that's a member of that family, that direction would be. We could convert that into our new format by just plugging in U prime, V prime, and W prime into these equations. So 
u would be equal to one-third 2 times 1 minus 0, right? So that's just 2 thirds. Uh, v would be equal to 1 third 2 times 0 minus 1. So that's just going to be negative 1 third. W is equal to just 0 because it's negative W. And then T, our last one is negative U plus V. So T would be equal to negative 1 plus 0. Sorry, negative is outside that. 1 plus 0. So it would be negative 1. So again, the, the 1, 0, 0, to summarize here, 1, 0, 0 is the same as 2 thirds, negative 1 third, uh, 0, negative 1. And then we could multiply that all by 3 to get it to be uh, integer values. This would be the same as 2, 1 bar, 0, 3 bar, right? These are identical. Yeah? Would W be 1 and U be 0? W. Yeah, let, let's change that and say that this, it's the, I said it was a member of the same family, but just to be not ambiguous here, let me write that. Any questions on this? It's a straightforward application of those formulas. Um, we're not, I'm not going to give you one of these on a test or anything with hexagonal symmetry. I'll only give you the other ones, but uh, question in the striped shirt? Um, does T equal U plus V or U prime plus V prime? Oh, good catch. That is, good catch. I messed that up. This is U and V, not U prime and V prime. I messed that up. Uh, let's, let's correct that. Thank you for catching that. So instead of 1 and 0 there, I have to use U and V. So that's 2 thirds and negative 1 thirds. So it would be negative 2 thirds plus negative one third. Thank you for catching that. So that gives us uh, negative one third, positive one third. Good catch, dude. Which makes this one third, which makes this thing just one. Good catch. Other question? Did I still mess up something? Oh, I did. That's still negative. Yeah, other questions? That was it? Okay, thank you for catching that. Again, I'm not going to put that on a test. I think you should know it. You will run into it in the literature. Just I don't want you to be like bamboozled and be like, what on earth is this? Is that, is that a 10? Is this 1, 1, 10 or something? What is that? No, it's, it's that in hexagonal systems, they use a different coordinate system for Miller indices, and it has four parameters instead of three. Okay? All right. The last thing we need to talk about with Miller indices is how to do planes. And this is notoriously a little bit tricky, but we're going to break it down into five easy steps, right? So if you've got these different planes going through material, right, all these like different planes that you could draw, how do you label them? Or if I gave you the Miller indices, how could you draw that plane? Here's the steps. Uh, first off, if your plane passes through your origin, pick a new origin. Let's go down to the cubic ones. They're easier. Right? Right? So let's do, let's do this one right there for a minute. Normally, we put our origin in that back corner, right? But if the plane passes through your origin, you have to pick a new origin. So fair enough. We can move that. Let's put our origin right here. You could put it wherever you want, as long as the plane's not passing through it. And it'll still give you the same answer, OK? So we put it there. The next step is identify, and I'm following these steps right here. Identify where the plane intersects your three different axes, okay? So again, remember we're talking about x, y, and z. So where does this plane intersect our x axes? The x axes from our origin it intersects it if we go back one in the x direction, right? So it intersects at negative one. What about the y? It actually never intersects our y-axis because it's running parallel to it, right? y is running that way, and so is the plane. They're just like shifted off by a unit cell. So it's parallel to it. It never intersects it, right? They, they just run next to each other. So we're going to say that it technically intersects it at infinity, OK? And then what about the z-direction? 
uh, same thing. It's running parallel to the z, so that's also infinity. All right, so we figured out where it intersects the x, y, and z. Okay, so what's our next step? Next step says, take reciprocals of these locations in terms of ABC. If there is no intersection, meaning it's parallel, then you had infinity, and the reciprocal 1 over infinity is 0. Okay, so when I take the reciprocal of these, you get negative 1, 0, and 0. Okay, then lastly right here, multiply by common factor in order to get integers. We're already there, and then you report these integers with no commas in round brackets, right? So that would be our plane, right? Negative 1, 0, 0, okay? Notice what they've drawn here. They call that the 0, 1, 0. That just means that they've oriented their axes differently than we chose to orient ours, but it's in the same family, right? Let's do another one. Let's do, let's just draw our own. So if we take another one, Let's draw this one. All right, how about that one? That's the one that's chopping that cube in half along the body diagonal, okay? So let's go ahead and do it. What are our rules? Again, first off, uh, we pick an origin. I'm gonna pick mine to be that back corner. We're allowed to pick it because the plane doesn't pass through it, right? That's behind the plane, the plane's in front of it. Then you just say, where does it intersect? Well, it intersects along the x direction at 1, it intersects along the y direction at 1, and it never intersects the z, right? So this is going to be 1, 1, infinity. We take the reciprocal of that, and it becomes 1, 1, 0. It's already integer, so we don't have to multiply it by anything. We put round brackets, and that is the 1, 1, 0 plane, okay? Let's do another one. Let's do... That's halfway up. This is at that corner. And this one goes down to a third of the way up. Right? Let's actually change that slightly. I'll make it less terrible. Let's do this one halfway. All right, that plane, you guys see it? It's halfway up on this one, and it's halfway up on that one what would be the Miller indices of that plane? How could we describe it so that everyone else could know exactly what we're talking about? Well, um, all you have to do is start, you have to pick an origin, right? Our origin works, right? Because it's not passing through it. The same origin that we had before, we can use the same one. Now you just start saying, where does it intersect our different axes? Well, it's a little bit tricky because here's our x-axis down here, and the purple line doesn't intersect it in the same unit cell. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't intersect it. It just intersects it outside in the next unit cell over, right? If it went from 1 to 1 half in one unit cell, if it keeps going, it would get to 0 the next unit cell. So that's 1, 2 unit cells away. Everybody follow that? It starts to get a little bit tricky here, right? Um, so that intersected it at 2, OK, for our x. What about y? y is the same thing. It went down half. Went down again and it intersected at 2. And then it intersected the z at 1. We flip that and that becomes half, half, 1. We multiply that by a common denominator and it becomes 1, 1, 2. That's a 1, 1, 2 plane. Okay? Any questions? Yeah. No, that, good question. The origin has to be one of the vertices of your unit cell. Otherwise, I, yeah, otherwise no one will know, they won't be able to get the same result as you. So by convention, your origin is always one of the corners of the unit cell. Good question. Other questions I can answer about this? There's lots and lots of worked examples in the book. There's lots here. Right, you can see this one. This is the 0, negative 1, 0 plane. That means that they chose this to be their origin, either that point or this point, because it, if this is your x direction, that's your y direction, it went back one in the y direction before it intersected it, right? That, that's where the negative one is there. How about this one, right? This is a little bit funky one. The one minus one, one plane. 
again, let's, let's pick something. Let's put our origin right there. It intersects the x at 1. It goes back 1 in the y direction. That's where the negative 1 comes from. It goes up 1 in the z direction, right? How about this one over here? This one's a little bit weird. Let's pick that top corner to be our, our origin. See how it goes around it. It intersects the x at 1 3rd. Let's write this one out. x is intersected at 1 3rd. y gets intersected at 1 half. And z gets intersected at negative 1. When you invert that, that becomes 3, 2, negative 1. 3, 2, negative 1. Any questions on this? Yeah. Sorry, which one? For the down OK. No, that was the question that he asked. You, your, your origin has to be on the vertices. Okay. Yeah. That, that's the only catch there. Now, one thing to realize is that these families of planes, they exist at ev since we can choose our origin to put it anywhere, that means that I could draw the same exact plane starting from a different origin, right? For example, let me give myself some room and see if I can draw this. What if I started from the next unit cell below us, right? Right, what if I was starting from down here? In that case, my plane, that purple plane, I could draw an equivalent purple plane. I'm going to draw it in green, but just like this. Right? These things are families of planes, right? But they're separated from one another. I, I understand it's a little bit crowded here, but there's a distance. If you were to take those planes, since these planes they extend infinitely, there's a distance between that green plane and that purple plane, right? We could say the distance between the green plane and the purple plane. We call that the D spacing. Lowercase d, that's the D spacing. Let me show you a simpler one where it's easier to see. Let's do it just on a, uh, just one of the, the faces of the cube. If this is our cube, and we're talking about maybe that plane along that face, there's an equivalent plane. If I was to you know, select my unit cell in the next, my origin in the next unit cell over, that would be this plane, right? For the next unit cell over, it's the same thing, right? These things extend infinitely, and that's the same thing as this one right there. So the separation distance between these things becomes a really important parameter. And in this case, that parameter d is equal to the lattice parameter. But that's not always the case, right? Imagine that we're looking, let's look down on a unit cell family. So if we're, actually, I'll just give ourselves some space so I don't confuse people. Let's say I'm looking down on four unit cells in the cubic family. And we have that same unit cell that we drew earlier, which is the one that cut it in half, right? This one that was cutting it in half. Remember, that was the one that we drew up here somewhere. Yeah, that was the, uh, the blue one that we drew. In any case, that's the plane that's chopping those in half. Now take a look at the, the interplanar spacing. Again, we call this the interplanar spacing, D. That is no longer equal to the lattice parameter, right? This is a different number. It's less than the lattice parameter. Right? That would be square root 2a divided by 2 instead of a. So that, that, the separation between these planes, the whole reason that I'm bringing it up is because that is the, it's critical to x-ray diffraction. That is the key thing that we measure when we measure x-ray diffraction. And from that plane separation, we can infer what the crystal structure is, right? which is it's pretty rad. I'll show you how to do it in just a minute. Okay. So as always, there's lots more examples on YouTube if you want to see lots more of these things worked out. Yeah, question? Interplanar spacing. I'll, we're going to show it in just a minute. Okay. Um, on these planes, there's different arrangements of atoms. Yeah, Chris, is it Kristen? Just, yes. Just to clarify, it's the perpendicular distance. That's right. The perpendicular between two planes. Right. The planes extend infinitely, but it's the closest, the shortest line that connects them. Okay. Um, along all these different planes, you have different arrangements of atoms. Right. Let's go back to our uh, FCC and BCC. If we draw our FCC crystal structure, then we know that we've got atoms located at all the corners, right? And also on the faces, right? So we could pick a plane. Let's choose, let me pick a different color. 
let's choose this front plane. And I could draw just that front plane and I could put my atoms on there, right? My atoms now look like this. I've got one centered, that, 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 and that, right? Because we know that they touch along the face. And so that would be a sketch of the 100 plane, right? Yeah, this is a sketch of the 100 plane. You'll need to be able to sketch different planes. I'm not going to do it for a hard crystal structure, but things like the ones we've talked about, FCC, BCC, even things like perovskite and zinc blend, I might ask you to say, this plane exists, sketch it, and show me where the atoms are at on it, right? All right? Um, when you do that, something else we can do is we can calculate the linear density or the planar density. So let's do linear density on this example that we just drew. What's the linear density going along that direction? First off, what is that direction? That's this one that goes from this corner to that corner. Turn to a neighbor and remind them what that direction would be. Anybody got it? What would that direction be? Again, you could do final minus initial if you want. Yeah, it doesn't move at all in the x direction, but it goes 1 in the y and 1 in the z. So that would be the 0, 1, 1 direction. So a fair question, oops, it got moved over. A fair direction would be to ask, what's the linear density along that direction? And what's the planar density along this plane? To do those calculations, all you do is you calculate the number of atoms either along the line or along the plane, and you divide it by the length of the line or you divide it by the area of the plane, right? So let's take this, let's do the uh, one that we just drew here. Yeah, for the, for the 0, 1, 1, which is in the 1, 0, 0 family, we'd say that the linear density, I'll just call it LD for a minute, it, it's the number of atoms that we intersect. So in this case, we are going to intersect half of an atom, one atom, and half of an atom. So we technically intersect two atoms, Right? And we do so by transversing root 2 multiplied by a. So if you knew what the lattice parameter was, you could actually give a number per angstrom, right? That's, how, that's the linear density. The planar density for the same example, it's the number of atoms on the plane. How many atoms are on this plane? Well, one is centered in the middle, plus four that are one fourth of the way in. So again, it's two. So it would be two, but this time it's the area, which is a squared. Any questions on linear and planar density? They're pretty straightforward calculations. Why do we care about them? Not just because like, you can calculate it, but because they're important. It turns out that the plane that has the highest planar density and in the direction of the highest linear density is where you get slip. And slip is when atoms slide past one another. So it's really important, right? Um, understanding how many planes are are really densely packed with atoms and in what direction will tell you how atoms are going to slide past one another when you apply a force. That's really important. Okay? All right, there's something called close packed structures. Close packed structures like the metals, we said these things want to sort of clump together as best they can because it's metallic bonding. They're all sort of sharing the electrons. So the more that they compact together, the happier they are. Um, it, it, there's something interesting that happens. FCC and HCP, that's face centered cubic, and hexagonal close packed, they are really similar. And the way that they differ is how you form these close packed layers. So here's an example. Take the white layer of atoms, right? The white layer is our bottom layer. If you put your next atom on top of it, you have a choice. You can put it on this sort of triangle up or on this triangle down spot, but you can't put it on both, right? If I tried to draw the same size atom, They would, they would overlap. I can't fit them both there. I've got a, a demo here where you can kind of see that. Let me move these over temporarily. So this is a, a bunch of tennis balls in a hexagonal close packed, like it's a, it's a hexagonal close packed arrangement. If I take a new tennis ball, I can choose to put it, if you're looking at this, this is triangle up, that's triangle down. But I can't put it on both. I have to choose one or the other for the different layers, right? So we give names to these layers. We call them the A layer, the B layer, or the C layer, right? So the, the first one you see here is the A layer. If you choose to put your next atom on the B layer, 
That's these black ones. That's on the uh, triangle down positions. That's these black atoms here. If you form a whole layer like that of now the black atoms, and then for your third layer, you go back to the A position, the original one, you end up with a hexagonal close packed lattice. If instead you go A, B, but on the third layer, you don't go back to the original A spot, which would be right here. Instead, you put it the next one up in the C position, we're going to call it. This becomes face centered cubic. And this is hard to see, but this might make it a little bit clearer. Logan, can I have you uh, help me? So I'm going to turn the camera on here, and it might be easier to see if I project it. So careful as you, as you can, careful on this thing. He's going to point this at it, and we'll see what happens here, right? So I've got some of these tennis balls colored green. By the way, coloring on tennis balls with a Sharpie, like if you thought like fingernails on a chalkboard was bad, like this like almost, almost put me over the edge. It is horrifying, <laughs> right? Um, this does, at first glance, you're like how on earth is a cube going to come out of this? But let's start placing things, right? I'm going to place, uh, if, you, if you can see these, can you look kind of down-ish? I'm going to place the second layer on what to you looks like a triangle up spot. See that one? So I'm going to place these ones there. Triangle up. I'm going to fill some of these other ones in, right? And then my next layer, if I went back to the original spot, if I can see this, my original spot would be right uh, back to there. That's on top of A. This, if I filled that out, would give me a hexagonal close packed. But if I put it right there, that's face centered cubic. Can you see it? Can you see those tennis balls? The, the ones that are colored are the corners of the cube. You see how that's now a cube? It's, it's just rotated along the body diagonal. You see that? So a lot of crystal structures can be envisioned as just different planes of close packed atoms. And that's what's happening here, right? FCC and HCP are really similar to one another. You've just chosen a different site to place that atom at. Thanks, Logan. Perfect. Thank you. Um, these will be around. In my, they're in my office. You can come try it for yourself. But that, that's the idea behind close packed structures. OK? Um, and that's why both of these compounds, remember when we did the math earlier in the, the class that these both had the exact same packing ratio, the atomic packing factor? It's because it's the same thing. You just shift, you chose a different site as you stack these things up. OK? So that's your ABC, you know, stacking layers. And, um, so that's all I'm going to say about that, actually. Okay, We've mentioned this earlier, but in this class, there's crystalline materials. Crystalline materials, like if I look at these tennis balls, how they stacked, they clearly are arranged in a periodic way. And if you were to take and you were to fill some object where every single atom is in its exact spot all the way to the end of the crystal, you create what's called a single crystal. Those are less common. They're, they're hard to form. So like gemstones, like if you have a diamond ring, those are typically single crystals of diamond, whereas the cutting tools that we make to cut roads and rocks with, that's polycrystalline diamond. Polycrystalline versus single crystal, it just means that you've got either one or multiple grains, right? So for example, if we zoomed in on this thing, on two different examples here, one case maybe you've got grains, and each grain is oriented in slightly different ways. So I'm not drawing a lamellar structure here. What I'm drawing is like how the atoms arrange themselves, like their orientation. This would be an example of a polycrystalline one, where there's different orientations. Each, one, each unit cells are rotated slightly differently. But a, a single crystal, it's perfect all the way through. right? And these things exist in nature. Like If you watch the, the BBC Earth series, this is Lechuguilla. Right? It's that cave in New Mexico. Those are gigantic, bigger than a person, single crystals. Right? They might have like some slight, what are called twinning, or a few grains. But for the most part, Every single atom in there, trillions and trillions of atoms, is located in a perfect periodic arrangement that's bigger than a person. Like, that's amazing. That's absolutely amazing that we can do that. Um, being able to grow these things is a big deal. When I was in Poland, I was actually at the Warsaw Institute of Technology, and um, gosh, how do you spell his name? Chikralski. Um, that's the home of Jan Chikralski, who invented the Chikralski method. Normally, if you melt something and you let it cool down, a bunch of little crystals are going to form from the edges and they'll grow in and you end up with a polycrystalline sample. 
And he realized, a little bit by accident, he had, he had some molten, I think it was tin, and he took the tip of his pen and he dipped it in the tin. I don't know why, but he did. <laughs> and he started like pulling it out and he realized when he drew it out, it was a single crystal, right? And so all of a sudden, this is the method that Intel, that I am Flash, that all these big semiconductor, you know, Fairchild, all these companies use to grow great big ingots of silicon, which are single crystals. They apply a seed crystal, they touch it to the surface, and they slowly draw it out. They actually rotate a little bit. There's some details that we're not talking about. But this whole thing is now a perfect single crystal when you draw it out, okay? Um, and that's how they make... Um, yeah, close enough. So if you look at one of these wafers, yeah, that is all a single crystal. That's not polycrystalline. They can grow great big ones like that. We grow them in our lab. We've done it a little bit, right? So that's single crystal growth, okay? So the, what's the point of me teaching you this? It's possible. It's challenging to do, but it's possible. And it may or may not have better properties. In some instances, the grain boundaries, that's these uh, spots between the different oriented regions, maybe those are a good thing, right? They might give you better strength, for example. Something we're going to learn about later in the class is that to deform a material, you have to make atoms slide past each other. Well, what if these atoms are sliding past each other, but then they hit something that doesn't let them keep on sliding? You're going to make that a stronger, harder material. So in the mechanical properties is typically worse, but other properties might be a whole lot better, right? Say optical properties. A diamond is totally transparent because it doesn't have grain boundaries, which would scatter light, right? Really nice diamonds, or if you ever hear about a diamond that has like a flaw in it, like a, an inclusion, things like that, those make your properties worse because you have grain boundaries in them and other things like that. Yeah, question? With, with conductivity, is that why silicon is better in the crystal structure? Because it's better in the conductor? Yeah, this is, the, the entire, like, this is hard to do, especially at the scale that these big companies do it. But the reason they do it is because when you have a perfect arrangement of atoms, your conductivity, the ability to transmit electrons through your material, which we will cover in chapter 12, is massively better. You, basically, they don't get scattered. They, don't, they, they move much more easily through your material. And that allows us to make better devices for all sorts of reasons. Okay? Um, if you have a single versus a polycrystalline material, you can observe something called anisotropy. And I saw it should be right here. That's when the physical property or whatever property that you measure depends on the crystallographic direction relative to the measurement. So, for example, if I go back to my single crystal, if I measure, let's say, conductivity in this direction and it's different in that direction, then it's an anisotropic property, right? If I measure it in this and that and whatever else and it's all the same, then it's an isotropic property. So let's say I'm, I'm pulling this thing and it has a strength in that direction, or I'm pulling it that way, it's different. It's anisotropic. Single crystals tend to be aniso anisotropic. Not all of them. Cubic ones actually aren't anisotropic. But other ones uh, tend to have anisotropy. Whereas polycrystalline materials, since there's billions or millions or whatever the number is of grains all randomly oriented, then on average, you don't see any influence of anisot anisotropy. And it looks to be what we call isotropic, where the properties are independent of the direction we load them, okay? We're out of time. Next class, we'll talk about extra diffraction probably for the whole class.